Okay, I'm really excited to, to, um, to begin this next three weeks. Because um, really, the, the pivot of, and focus of our faith is this call to fellowship, uh, to follow Jesus. And um, your faith life begins perhaps at the baptismal font, where Jesus claims you once and for all as his. But um, in many other ways, our faith life begins as we begin to take advantage of or to reach out for the hand that's been extended to us by Jesus when he calls you by name and says, come and follow me out into this big, beautiful, sacred life. Okay? And that's where the adventure um, begins. And for those of us who are along the way on that journey, it's good for us to remember once in a while that we have um, been called by name to follow. So I want to talk a little bit today about following. And it's a word that doesn't rest easy on my ears. Um, my generation has been the product of a whole bunch of literature and thought about leadership. And um, that's the word that tends to excite. It's the word we tend to gravitate towards. But our primary identity as people of Jesus is that we are followers. And I want to reclaim that word today. Okay? The video that I want to show you here at the beginning is really quirky. And it's a very much amateurishly shot little video. So there may be moments where, where it's just a little too shaky for you to want to watch. But I want you to listen to the commentary because it's brilliant. And it talks about how important it is for a leader to have followers, and particularly how important it is to have a first follower. And if you think about it, this was the strategy, finally, that Jesus committed himself to, was to call together a group of people who would follow him out into this world. Okay? And we stand in, in that line. So if you would, please. Um, watch this with me for about three minutes, okay? If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over-glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. Okay, I warned you, okay? It was quirky. But you know, when you think about it, this was exactly the strategy that Jesus employed. He was a lone nut out there showing people a different way to live. 
And, um, and all he had was the trust that people would follow him. And uh, God's Holy Spirit made it so. So with that in mind, I want to read two pieces of scripture um, today from the Gospels. The first is a story from the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter. Early on in Jesus' public ministry, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. As he went from there, Jesus saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, mending their nets, and Jesus called out to the brothers. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. From the fourth chapter of Matthew. And now from the second chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus went out again beside the lake. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And Levi got up and followed Jesus. Later, as they sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples. For then there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to the disciples, why does Jesus eat with these people? And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, those who are well have no need of a physician but I have come to call not just the righteous, but call sinners. Matthew chapter 2. Um, if you would please join me in a prayer, and then we'll continue. Okay. Um, gracious God, somehow in each of our lives you have called us by name and said to us, come and follow me. Come and follow me out into this life. Come and follow me, and I'll show you a new way to live. Um, give us hearts and minds and spirits that are willing to follow um, courageously out into this world. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first few centuries of the church, there was a Greek word that became very um, familiar, their favorite word in, des in describing what was emerging as a concept of the Trinity. Now, you have to understand, before Jesus and before the day of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit, there was no need to think about or to conceive of how God works in three very different ways. But all of a sudden, they had seen it for the first time. That not only was there a God who had created everything, but God also moved in this person, Jesus, in a singular and unique way. And think of how they struggled trying to, trying to identify Jesus. Son of man, son of God, Messiah, Emmanuel, Lord, Prince of Peace, Mighty Counselor, on and on and on and on. Okay? And then when Pentecost happened and the Spirit was let loose in this world, all of a sudden they realized that God functioned in three very different ways, in flesh, in Jesus, in the creation all around them, and in the spirit who sometimes tangible but most often invisible seemed to move in powerful ways in the world. And the Greek word that they came up with compounded two words, the word dance and the word around. And the way they conceived of this holy trinity was being, it was God's own self partaking in a dance of three persons that moved throughout the world to God's purposes. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Um, perikinesis is the word, to dance around. And then they had this person, Jesus, who came and sang a new song and danced a new dance in this world and said, watch me and follow me. And for a while, all people could do was to gather and stare at this new song and this new dance and this new reality in the world. But one by one, they came and followed him. And you and I are in that same line. And sometimes we get it all confused. We think that somehow this is about knowing, that somehow it's about being sure or being right. But it's really just about following. I've been trying hard for a couple of weeks now to think of a good analogy for this, and one kind of finally sprang up. My son Andrew, his, one of his best friends is named Jens, and Jens has had a girlfriend. Um, they've been in relationship, Jens and Kathy, for several years since high school. They've now graduated from college, and they're off um, living their life. And on Valentine's Day, Andrew got a little video on his phone um, featuring Kathy and Jens announcing that they were engaged. Okay. And then I got an email about two days later which was really fun, was worded in a really funny way. Jen's 
um, reached out to me to ask if I would do the wedding, but the way in which he said it was something like, you're the only pastor I would invite to my wedding. Okay, I, I, I don't think that's quite what he meant, okay? But either way, I'll take it. And I'm very excited to be a part of that wedding. And what I've been thinking about for them is that this is, you know, a wedding and the promises we make seem so impossible. But really what it is is two people grabbing hands to each other and saying, come with me. They don't know the future. They don't know what this means. And the older I get and the younger these couples seem to me, the more I realize you have no clue. <laughs> and I almost want to say to them, are you sure? <laughs> okay, for all the spouses who laughed a little harder than they should have, <laughs> you know, good luck the rest of the day, okay? I, I didn't do that, okay? But there is a sense where look really close because this is a person you get to walk with through all sorts of seasons, right? And in many ways, that's what Jesus offers, but with a promise. Jesus simply says, come walk with me. And all the knowing and the being and the doing will just follow. And think about how we teach our kids what we know about education, right? The best way to learn is to watch and then to do. And that's what Jesus did with his disciples. It was never a seminary examination. It wasn't a big list of, can you get all these things right? Can you ace the test? It was, come and do what I do. Come with me. It was an apprenticeship. Okay? It was a walk. It was a walk. And Jesus doesn't worry about your qualifications. He just says, come. And that's how this always starts. And frankly, it's also how it ends. That finally, even at the end of this mortal life, we just hang on. And he says, come with me because there is more. Okay. So I want to just talk a little bit about some random thoughts about this following that we do with Jesus. Okay. Um, Levi is a really good example, and he was in this story. Levi becomes the gospel writer Matthew. His name changes. But Levi was in this really terrible position in his life, but he had chosen it. The Roman Empire had come and dominated Israel, and it was um, an empire, and it had its, you know, boot on Israel's throat. And this proud nation was now captive, and they had to pay taxes to the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, like all occupying forces, you know, divides people, and so it recruited people like Levi to collect taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire. And you can imagine what Levi's friends and family and community people thought of him when he took that job, okay? Because the way in which he made his money is that anything he collected from the community over and above the tax that he was going to send to Rome was his to keep. And so this was a job for scoundrels. This was a job for people whose character perhaps was a little questionable. Now on top of that, not only was he now a pariah to everyone he called community, the Roman Empire was no kinder to him because they thought Jews were barely human. They looked upon a guy like him who had sold out with disdain. And so this was a man who truly had nobody but other tax collectors and other marginalized people to associate with. So he's sitting there at his tax uh, collecting booth one day, and Jesus walks by, this rabbi, this holy man, and Jesus looks at him and says, You, Levi, come with me. Take a walk with me. Now, rabbis were different than prophets or priests. Prophets were these scandalous people that came and kind of renounced the whole culture and the whole society from time to time in Israel's life. Jesus had a little bit of prophet in him, but he mainly wasn't that. Priests were these people who grew up in families of priests, tribes of priests, who maintained the worship order for the people of Israel. He wasn't really a priest either, although he came from a priestly family. Instead, he was a rabbi, which was a teacher. And rabbis um, collected little groups of people that became their students, their disciples, and literally traveled with them, and the rabbi showed them how to live. So when this rabbi shows up, and here's Levi, taking taxes for their own empire and skimming off the top for himself, Jesus comes to him and says, I want you. I choose you. See, with Rose, most rabbis, um, students would choose them. 
Jesus was the one here doing the choosing, however, and he looks at Levi and says, I nominate you. And you have to wonder what happened in Levi's head. You know, he had to be thinking to himself, are you talking to me? And he had to think to himself for just a second there, what if I actually do this? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me? I can't go back to doing this again. So what is in this for me? But he steps out and he follows. Okay. There is that sense with each one of us too. Sometimes the church has sanitized this process so much that we think we have to become religious before Jesus will accept who we are. Not the case. Jesus just simply looks at us, each of us, just exactly the way we are and says, come with me. And that's where it starts. Okay. Then there's another sense about followership with Jesus, that there are times where it is clear, where you know the route, where Jesus feels proximate to you, and you live with confidence. And there is a kind of knowing. There's a kind of un unveiling of the truth. There's a sense at which you, you feel like you're maturing, you feel like you're growing, you feel like you're more sure of what you know, more clear about what the world is about, where your heart has grown, your generosity and your compassion has grown. You begin to act more like Jesus all the time in terms of the way you engage with people and engage with the needs of the world. But then there are other times where this whole art of following Jesus is about embracing a mystery of a life that we just can't understand. That there are times where it's more like walking in the dark, where it's more of a trust walk, where sometimes even the, the grasp of Jesus' hand seems tenuous and maybe even imaginary, elusive. A couple of days ago, there was a big fog bank over the river here. And as I drove in from the north into town, just when it got to the point where you should be able to see the town, it was just a big white blanket. And I thought to myself, you know, the real beauty of this Christian faith, this Christian walk with Jesus, is sometimes we step out into the mystery and we embrace it and realize there's things we're never going to know about ourselves or about this world or about God's purposes until the great kind of by and by. There's just more out there. And that sometimes we live in ambiguity and mystery and pain and brokenness. And that's what faith is. Okay. One last concept for today. And that is that in the Roman Catholic Church, and I don't know that I can pronounce this Latin word correctly, is um, a concept about bread for the journey. It's called via ticum. Um, and it's usually associated with the communion that's given at last rites. That as you are dying, there's this bread for the journey that's given to you as you journey from this life to the next. Okay. And I think it's a beautiful concept. How, how many of you have ever gone to a summer camp where you backpacked or you canoed or something like that? Anybody here? Okay, great. Uh, most of those great camps have like somebody in the, in the cooking staff that has devised um, a recipe for a great bread. Okay? And it takes on a legendary characteristic. Because sometimes, like when I've been out in the Rockies, out at Christicon or something like that, you know, you're out for 10 days or so, and you're so hungry. And anything that seems tasty and, and, and wonderful takes on this life of its own, okay? Until about the 10th day of the trip, in which case you never want to see it again, ever, okay? But this bread for the journey is always a fortified bread, okay? They put stuff in there so that you can make it through these hard days. And I love that image. And you and I get to celebrate bread for the journey here in just a few minutes. Okay? You see, the way of following Jesus isn't just a nice, brisk walk. Sometimes we stumble, and we fall, and sometimes we run, and we sprint, and we feel alive, and we feel like every move we make is absolutely right, and we find life there, we find energy there, we find purpose there, and then other times we're in the dark, and we're tripping ourselves, and sometimes we come to a full stop. And sometimes we can spend a whole season of our life wondering if we're going to ever get moving again. That's the way of Jesus. It's never just one thing. And Jesus gives us bread for this journey. We take this bread of communion, and um, one of the great rules of backpacking or a canoeing is that you start together and you stop together. So you never get too far out ahead of each other. You never lose contact or lose sight. And when you start in the morning, no matter, and every group has them, 
Some are faster, some are slower. Some feel stronger that day, some feel weaker that day. And one of the most challenging things for any group is when one of them gets sick or one of them gets hurt, and you have to bring that one along with you. Okay? I think Jesus has that same ethic. He will start with you, and he will finish with you, and you will never be alone. And when you get beat up or bruised or broken or hurt or ill or sick, he gives you bread for the journey to heal you up. So we come to this meal, and we accept this bread for the journey, and we leave here our brokenness and our, our, our wounds and our illness, and we take this bread for life so that we can be restored and join Jesus once again on this journey out into this world. Okay. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let us embrace him as all of those things. In Jesus' name, amen.